Let's bring in right now the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, and also former reporter for the Wall Street Journal, Matthew Brzezinski, who has a guest essay for MSNBC titled The American Jewish Community Must See Through Netanyahu Cynicism. Jonathan, we have so much, uh, so much uh, to, to talk to you about. I'm so glad you're here. I'd like you to do two things here. One, respond to what Donald Trump said about how Jews who vote for Democrats are bad Jews and hate their religion. And two, I need you to counsel, counsel Donnie. I need you to help Donnie through. And I'm serious because Donnie, like a lot of American Jews, are really twisted up right now. Obviously, we talked about the pain uh, and the heartache and, and, and just the fear after October 7th. Right now, uh, a lot of a lot of Jewish Americans are grappling with, with other feelings, mixed feelings about Netanyahu, what they're seeing on the front pages of the newspaper, how to sort through it all. What, what are your thoughts? Well, there's a lot there. Um, let me try to break it down. So first, with respect to what President Trump said, obviously, it's patently false and prejudicial. It is bigotry to say that Jews hate Israel if they vote for the Democratic Party. I don't need President Trump or any politician to lecture me on how I am supposed to vote. And the, Israel has been a bipartisan concern for decades and decades and decades. There's been consensus on supporting the Jewish state because it's a democracy, because it's our best ally in the Middle East, because it's committed to the same kind of values that America is committed to. And so for that reason, again, Democrats and Republicans have been good on Israel. But look, the person who dines with Nick Fuentes, you know, it's kind of calling the kettle black to tell us what's anti-Semitic or not. I mean, really, yeah. Yeah. I mean, give me a break, <laughs> really. But, but to, your, to your second point, like I read Matthew's essay about his daughter and it was painful for me. It's painful to see the spike in anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States. We just did one of our surveys, Joe, and we found like a decade ago, 9% of Americans had intense anti-Semitic attitudes. Today, 10 years later, it's almost 25%, okay? And the numbers among young people are even more intense. Typically, there's an Archie Bunker effect. Older people are more prejudiced than younger people. Not now, not when it comes to anti-Semitism. But I have to say one thing, and this is maybe for Donnie, because you were trying to bring it back, Donnie, and I appreciated that. And Elise was talking about, you know, the, the, the people being operated on without anesthesia and the pain and the suffering. Let us not forget the 130 hostages being held in tunnels below Gaza, the disabled and the elderly, men and women, innocent people who were raped, tortured, torn from their homes while their loved ones were murdered alongside of them. And I say this because what makes this different than after 9-11 in Afghanistan, what makes this different than after you know the situation in Syria, is there are innocent people being held in a tunnel system built by Hamas over two decades that apparently rivals the Paris metro. So again, I want this war to end. Every innocent killed is a disaster. Every civilian who dies, it's a tragedy. But if Hamas returned the hostages today, this would end like that. So when we talk about a ceasefire, we talk about a cessation of violence, when we talk about the young people like Eddie did, let's keep in mind why this started. And I'm not a military strategist. I don't know how to quote, end Hamas, although I agree with the sentiment, but I do know these hostages need to come home now. They have nothing to do with a global conflict. And Hamas's homicidal agenda, if you want to end that, start by bringing the hostages home, period. Matthew, in your uh, new piece, you write in part this, quote, American Jews have long identified with the underdog. They rallied to the defense of black Americans during the civil rights movement, often at great personal peril, and more recently served as key supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now Israel's long-term prospects could depend on American Jews taking up the cause of a two-state solution, difficult as that may be in the aftermath of Hamas's terrorism. The stakes are incredibly high. If Israel continues to follow Netanyahu's disastrous path, Israel risks becoming diplomatically isolated and a pariah 
state. And I, I've got to say, Matthew, on a more personal level, uh, th I mean, th for you, this is extraordinarily personal for you as a daughter uh, on, on a college campus uh, who is being shouted at for wearing your Star of David. Yes, well, I mean, so my children are Jewish under rabbinical law, but more importantly, they've all decided that they want to identify as Jews culturally. And I wholeheartedly supported that decision. And uh, unfortunately, in the past few months, it's a decision that um, has led them to be harassed and one that they are showing tinges of regret for. And that alarmed me. And so um, I decided uh, to speak out. And I think that um, they're representative of, um, you know, as you were saying earlier, the younger generation in this country is is heartbroken by what's going on over there. and. Uh, Netanyahu has reputationally brought Israel to the brink. Sam Stein, uh, do you have a question for Jonathan Greenblatt? Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, I, I hear you and I understand uh, exactly where you're coming from. I think uh, many Jews feel like Trump's attack on dual loyalty is prejudicial. And I also understand where you're coming from on uh, how you want to see this war ended. I, I, I wonder, though, when you look at the Netanyahu government, uh, does part of you fear at all uh, what he's doing to uh, Jews not in Israel, uh, that, he, that his actions have isolated uh, Israel, but also uh, sparked a wave of anti-Semitism? And I don't mean that to blame Jews for a spike of anti-Semitism, but I do think that the two are interrelated. And I'm curious if you have thought about that and if you uh, feel angst at how this Israeli government has prosecuted this war? Look, <clears throat> I feel angst all the time, I think. I think that's part of the Jewish condition, Sam. Yes, fair enough. But uh, what I will tell you is that there's no question uh, Bibi Netanyahu is certainly not my favorite politician, right? And I have criticized him, and I have criticized the policies of his government. But the fact of the matter, and you just said something that I want to draw on, I don't like blaming the victim. In the year 2022, when uh, Naftali Bennett was the prime minister, when they had an Arab Muslim in the coalition, the most diverse leadership coalition in Israel's 75 year history, we had here in America, Sam, the highest number of anti Semitic incidents we'd ever tracked until that time. So, again, a liberal democracy with a multicultural, multi political coalition. And yet still anti-Semitism was raging here in the United States. And now I'm sure the numbers are going to be far worse for this year. Spasms of violence in the Middle East often trigger anti-Jewish action here. But did anyone think it was okay when Asian American people were being assaulted, when they were being harassed and victimized because of what Beijing was doing around COVID? Did anyone think, would anyone think it was okay, Sam, if worshipers at Russian Orthodox churches were harassed and harangued by masked activists because they're upset about Ukraine. I mean, that, that idea is preposterous. Would anyone think it would be okay to vandalize, you know, Panda Express because you're upset about the Uyghur Muslims? Of course, that would be absurd. But somehow it's open season on Jews. In just the past week, Modest, or two weeks, Modest Yahoo, a Jewish musician, he wasn't allowed to do his concert in Chicago because Chicago PD said they didn't have enough protection. My friend Brett Gelman, uh, an actor and an author, his book signings have been canceled in places like Los Angeles because of protests about Gaza. When American Jews are blamed for what's happening in the Middle East, that should worry all of us because we know as Americans, we are a multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy and it is not okay to hold anyone collectively responsible for things you don't like around the world. But yet when it comes to Jews, we're told, hide your star of David. When it comes to Jews, we're told, you need more protection at your synagogue. When it comes to Jews, we're told it's your fault and you need to protect yourselves. I mean, this is nuts. I'll make one last point. After the murder of Jamal Khashoggi by the Saudi government, the protector of the holy places, the embodiment of Islam, would anyone have said it's okay to, again, stage demonstrations in front of mosques or Islamic centers? 
to ban Rami from doing a show, but that's what's happening here now to Jews. And it is not okay. That should alarm all of us because this isn't just anti-Semitic, Sam. This is anti-American. When a slice of your colleagues and neighbors and friends and family members are being told, hide your identity, squelch your religion, because it's open season on you, but that's what's happening on our college campuses right now. That's what's happening in public places right now. So I'm not disputing right. the tragedy in Gaza, but I am saying protect your Jewish family members and friends with everything you got, because right. this is a moment when it counts. All right, Elise. Matthew, Elise Jordan here. I have now what's kind of an impossible question to ask, but I have to ask you as your uncle was Dr. Brzezinski, what would he do right now if he were looking for a diplomatic solution, looking to push the situation in a more realistic direction as he was such a practitioner of the school of realism? Well, he, he actually long advocated that Israel's long-term security was intricately linked with Palestinian uh, well-being. And he felt that um, you know, the, the fate of the Palestinians was often put aside uh, in the name of regional security and that this was short-sighted and could lead to situations such as the one we find ourselves in now. So, you know, I think that he would advocate for an immediate ceasefire. I think he would advocate for massive aid and, and food to flood into Gaza because, you know, if people around the world start seeing photographs similar to one that the New York Times uh, published earlier in the week of, of starving children. Oh boy, that's going to be, that's going to make Jonathan's job really hard. Um, it's going to be disastrous. Um, and I think he would advocate for, um, you know, countries from all over the world to come in and, and launch uh, a reconstruction program and, you know, and finally put it end to, you know, this has been going on for half a century. Uh, and, um, you know, a two, whether it's a two-state solution, some hybrid model, but, you know, I think that this, this, this has to end uh, and it is hurting everyone. And most of all, you know, it is hurting Israel. Uh, and I think that if this was solved, support for Israel would come flooding back. And there's a, you know, a, a historical blueprint for that right here in America. You know, as, as Joe mentioned, after 9-11, we went into Iraq um, and um, even our staunchest allies were, you know, fled and our international uh, standing plummeted. And Obama was elected, took us out of Iraq, and all those allies, they, you know, the world breathed a collective sigh of relief, and all those allies came flooding back. I am sure that uh, support for Israel, um, you know, would would absolutely go back to what it once was um, it, once this issue is uh, solved. All right, Matthew Brzezinski, thank you so much. You can read his guest essay on MSNBC.com. And CEO of Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, thank you as well as always. Greatly appreciate it.